sa plume, c'est sa pioche. Quoi. Her writing was the tool she used to dig down deep into her inner self. You gave me the gift of being able to read. Would you give me the gift of being able to write as well? When she says, who will tell this story if I don't do it? You can't help being touched by this decision to write. People are scared of reading this book because of the concentration camps which represented such a terrible moment in history that still affects us today. This book is full of joy. If I had to use one word, it would be the word joy. Reading the ten notebooks of her diary, one notices a change that is quite extraordinary, a kind of openness to the outside world, to others and to Jewish people. My God, I love to stop for a while in a warm, safe place. However, I wouldn't hesitate to confront the cold as long as you are there to take me by the hand. Wherever I am, I try to spread a little of this love, this real love of my neighbour that I have within me. I don't wish to be anything special. I'm only trying to become that person who is already inside of me, who is searching for completeness. Here we are in this terrible place, the Westerbork camp, where tens of thousands of Dutch Jews were kept before being deported to the death camps of Eastern Europe between 1942 and 1944. Among these victims, there was a young Dutch woman called Etty Hellissem. The private diary and the letters that she wrote from this camp were published in the beginning of the 1980s. She describes in them a real spiritual experience that continues to affect people's lives today. Eddie Hellison left this camp on the 7th of September 1943 in a cattle truck. She was accompanied by 987 people, including 140 children. She died in Auschwitz on the 30th of November 1943. She was 29 years old. Her prophetic voice is still one of the most needed voices in today's world. Etty Hellison was born on the 15th of January 1914 in a non-practicing Jewish family that was fully integrated in the Dutch society. She suffered from the disagreements of her parents, whose temperaments were very different. Her mother was of Russian origin and she had an unpredictable, passionate and dominating nature. Her father was a professor of literature and an introverted and taciturn man. Etty had two brothers, Jacob called Yap, who became a doctor, and Misha, or Michel, the younger one who was a brilliant pianist, but a boy who had psychological problems. At the age of 18 years, Etty left the family home to begin studying law in Amsterdam. In 1937, she moved in with Han Vecharef, a widow, and became his companion. On the 10th of May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. The Nazi persecution was soon to be unleashed against the Jews. At first, Etty didn't seem to be too affected by this. She was a provocative young woman, she went to parties and had lots of friends. However, she didn't feel very good. Deep inside of me, she wrote at the beginning of her diary, there's a kind of knot of emotions, an iron grip that is holding me back. That is why she went to consult Julius Speer, a German Jewish refugee living in Amsterdam. Speer was a psychotherapist, a disciple of Jung. 
So there I was at his place, me and my knotted soul. Throughout my life I had wished for someone just to take me by the hand and take care of me. I give the impression of being so full of energy, depending only on myself, but I'd be so happy just to abandon myself. And here was this person that I'd never met before, this Monsieur Spier, with his infathomable looks, who took care of me, and within a week he had already done miracles. Gymnastics, breathing exercises, a few enlightening, liberating words regarding my periods of depression, my relationships with others, etc. All of a sudden my life had changed. I felt freer. The knotted sensation went away. I felt the beginnings of some peace and harmony within me. I was struck by the sincerity and depth of this young Jewish woman, who initially didn't belong to any religion. She was a Jew, but she didn't go to the synagogue. Her many relationships with young men were not helping her progress in life. I think that I'm going to give it a go. Every morning before starting my work, I'm going to undertake an interior reflection listening to myself for half an hour, entering into myself. It's easy to shake one's arms, legs and other muscles every morning in the bathroom, but this isn't enough. Man is body and spirit. An hour of peace isn't so easy. It takes practice. She appreciated Spear, her therapist, not for his ambivalence, because she knew about that from the beginning. She appreciated him rather for his combative side. Often she mentions, this man is like me. He is engaged with an interior struggle with himself. Even physically, there are two parts to his face. She fell in love with Spear. There was a love aspect to her friendship with him because she sent something in him that resembled herself. There was, of course, a narcissistic side, but it echoed with Spear's own interior struggle that, like hers, had a strongly sensual and spiritual side to it as well. What touches me was that she remained true to herself in all things. At the start, she was a very passionate, ambitious woman, going in all sorts of directions at the same time. Her descriptions of herself are at times rather crude. And later on, as she says in her own words, this creative ambition becomes an interior dialogue. And in fact, she says, it's all within us. Everything that she had sought in others, in the world, everything that she'd sought in life, in literature, and in music, she finally found it within herself. From the very first day, she understood that this man would be able to help her. The teaching methods of this man, who had become her mentor, were similar to those of the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. Accepting someone who needs to work things out respecting this journey of discovery and then guiding this person towards his or her deep need using Holy Scripture. He was 20 years older than her, but this man had, little by little, discovered that the meaning of life is the discovery of the transcendent God. She looked back over her life, rereading certain writers like Dostoevsky, citing his poems, ceaselessly transcribing them. I believe that literature helped her get better. Real therapy is possible by spending time reading the works of St. Augustine, Rilke, or the works of Dostoevsky.
I first read the words of Etty when I was 20 years old. I had completely left the faith because I thought that the church was not living according to what it preached. And as I read Etty's words, I realized that the God she was talking about was the one that I was looking for. Etty was one of the people who brought me back to the church because I found God later on in the church. The way she speaks about her faith, her authenticity, the way she practices what she preaches, touched me deeply. What I love about her is not only the self-acceptance, the acknowledgement of reality, but also her persistent faith in the greatness that lies within each one of us. She says, we must remain faithful to our higher feelings, not let them weigh us down, but rather draw strength from them. At this time, the Jews began to experience persecution. She understood that she was also under threat, but she refused to go into hiding like some of her Dutch friends. She said, I'm going to stay here until the bitter end because she was fully aware of the fate awaiting the Jewish people. She had a way of connecting to what was really happening. She was like a hermit living in the heart of the world. I shall try to help you, my God, not to be extinguished in me, though I cannot vouch for it in advance. Yes, God, there doesn't seem to be much you yourself can do about our circumstances, about our lives. One thing is becoming increasingly clear to me. You cannot help us, but we must help you and defend your dwelling place inside us to the last. And in doing this, we will help ourselves. I'm going to help you, my God, not to be extinguished in me. And then further on, she says, I'm going to defend your dwelling place inside us. So she wasn't expecting everything to come from God. She knew that she was living with a God who is powerful in his humility, a God who is disarmed. And she would put her whole will at the service of God, which meant the total giving of self. For us, this speaks volumes. She was at the center of the Nazi system, couldn't get any worse. And yet, there is joy here. She says some words to her friend Roux, which show what she was like. You know, Roux, there's something very childish in me that finds life is beautiful and which helps me to cope with everything, the fact that I believe in God. This is the only time we hear her say that, and it says everything. What is important is that her joy finds its source in God.
There are, it's true, some who, even at this late stage, are putting their vacuum cleaners and silver forks and spoons in safekeeping, instead of guarding you, dear God. And there are those who want to put their bodies in safekeeping, but who are nothing more now than a shelter for a thousand fears and bitter feelings. And they say, I shan't let them get me in their clutches. But they forget that no one is in their clutches who is in your arms. How great is the inner suffering of your earthly creatures, my God. I thank you for having sent so many people to me with all their suffering. They speak to me at length with no thought and without warning and suddenly their misery breaks through in all its nakedness and then I have a wreck of a human being before me desperate and not knowing how to go on living. Here is where my difficulties begin. It's not enough just to preach about you, my God, in order to bring you to others. I have to clear the way in them which leads to you my God, and in order to do that, it's necessary to know the human soul well. Like many Jews, her parents were sent into a camp at Westerbork, in the north of Holland. She asked to go into this camp in order to be with these poor Jews in their suffering. She could have escaped that. She notes that in this rather desperate environment, she was reconciled with her parents. I walked with father the other day, and we struggled against a kind of sandstorm. He was charming as always, and showed a great stoicism. He told me in a very friendly and calm tone and with great detachment. I would really prefer to go to Poland as soon as possible to get this over with quicker. I would spend three days there. There's no sense in prolonging this degrading existence in a camp. Why am I spared what is happening to thousands of others? And then we joked about the situation. Here in Amsterdam, naturally, we know Anne Frank, this world-famous young Jewish girl. I think that Etty is a woman of the same caliber, and Anne Frank at a later stage in her life, if she had lived longer. She deserves the same recognition and for her writings to be made known. What strikes me as the main thing in her spiritual life is her total rejection of hatred, despite the terrible injustice meted out to the Jews. She refused to hate. She always thought well of each person, including her oppressors. It's impossible to understand someone's life if we only know about external events. In order to know someone's life, we have to know their dreams how they got on with their parents, their soul, their disappointments, their illness and their death. So, did you have an unhappy childhood? Or did your fiancé leave you? I would like to meet this man with all his worries and find the cause and help him to fight the battle and put up defences inside himself. The verhouding that she... This relationship with God became very intimate, gentle and full of tenderness, and gave her an inner strength which helped her to face up to difficult times. She wanted to see everything, know everything, 
and understand everything. She didn't want to miss anything. She didn't want to run away. She wanted to remain in solidarity with her people. To me, people are a bit like houses with open doors. I walk in and roam through the passages and rooms. In each house, the decoration is slightly different, but they are all very similar. And in each one of them, we should be able to make a sanctuary for you, my God. It's a funny picture. I set out to find you a roof. There are so many houses that are not lived in, where I'd like to invite you as a guest of honour. People can be completely destroyed. This could have been the case with her. It happened to many people during the war. Etty, on the other hand, accomplished a lot there. She helps me to follow this way of holiness, to be a happy man. Whatever background a person has, however tragic it is, it can't prevent us from meeting God. With her we could say that it was her own tragic history that triggered her meeting with God. I think many people are very touched by that. This afternoon, I was resting on my bed, when suddenly I felt I should write this in my journal. You have made me so rich, O oh God. Please let me share your beauty with open hands. My life has become an uninterrupted dialogue with you, O oh God. Sometimes when I stand in some corner of the camp, my feet on your earth, my eyes raised towards your heaven, tears sometimes run down my face, tears of deep emotion and gratitude. And at night, when I lie in my bed and rest in you, O God, tears of gratitude run down my face, and that is my prayer. On the 7th of September, 1943, under the orders of the SS commander, Etty was deported to Auschwitz with her parents and her brother Misha. Jopi, a friend in her adversity, tells us her story. So, here I am, feeling a bit sad, but still not too sad about what we have lost because a friendship like hers can never be lost. She is here and she will remain here. This is what I scratched onto a piece of paper that I slipped into her hand at the last moment. Then I lost sight of her and I wandered around a little. I saw her mother and her father get into carriage number one with Misha. Etty was in carriage number 12 after having looked for a friend in carriage 14 who was pulled from the carriage at the last minute. Then the train left, a high-pitched whistle and a thousand of our number were taken to be deported. One last fleeting glance of Misha, who put his hand through a slit in the carriage number one, waved goodbye. Etty shouted a joyful, bye, and they were gone. Before the train left Holland, Etty threw a card through a slit in the carriage addressed to her friend, Christine van Houten. The card was found and posted by some people working in the country. Here is her last letter. Christine, Opening the Bible at random, I find this. The Lord is my high tower. 
I'm sitting on my rucksack in the middle of a full freight car. Father, mother and Misha are a few carriages away. Our departure was pretty unexpected. An order from Lae, especially for us. We left the camp singing, father and mother very calm and brave, and Misha also. We shall be travelling for three days. Thank you for all your kindness and care. Farewell from all four of us. Eti. This month we can pray for all the young people who are trying to live their lives to the full. That they can find the way to the one who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. The word of the month is in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 and 16. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in His ways. Then you will live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you.